Since the page we're looking at doesn't have any CSS in it, it's a great way to actually take a look at our properties and a way to start CSS if we don't have any in there already. So let's make sure that we're in the actual design view of the page so that we can see our property inspector. At the very bottom of our property inspector is a button called Page Properties. Go ahead and click on it. And once it pops up, I have several different categories. I have Appearance CSS, I have Appearance HTML, I have a Links, Heading, Title, and Tracing Image. So when we add things to our Appearance in our CSS file here, we're going to make our own CSS embedded in the page itself. But let's take a look at some of the options that we have. So we can choose a page font from here. If I click on this, I see several different types of fonts available. Again, using the same sort of naming that we did before, meaning that I want to make sure and add what I would like first. If they don't have any of those, then I can choose either a serif or sans serif. Later, we'll talk more about fonts and what's available for the web. For now, we're just going to choose, let's say, Verdana. Now I get to choose whether it's going to be bold or italic. Again, this is probably not the best place to just click a B or an I button. We can make those choices later. This is for the entire page. This is going to be our default for all of our pages. So next I want to choose a size. Notice that I have pixels over here to the side, but we're going to put 62.5. And then I'm going to choose, instead of pixels, points, inches, centimeters, millimeters, picas, m's, x's, I'm going to choose percent. We can also define a text color. It's really just good practice to make sure that you're defining a text color as well. So this, again, this is going to be attached to our body tag. So at the moment, let's just choose a simple black. You'll notice that Dreamweaver automatically uses that three-digit hexadecimal shorthand for black, so it uses three zeros instead of the six, since it's a series of repeating numbers. Also notice that it has that pound sign in front of it. So that's going to show up here automatically in this color picker, but let's say you went to Photoshop's color picker and found a color that you wanted to use. You can copy that hexadecimal number and put it in your code, just make sure that you put the pound sign in front of it because Dreamweaver won't recognize that as a color unless that pound sign is there. Since this is a repeating number, it can also be a shorthand CSS by just 000. I'm going to go ahead and give it a background color. And at the moment, we do not have a background image for our file, so we won't be putting one in there. If I had one, I could also designate whether it's going to repeat not repeat, repeat just to the left X, or repeat down from the page on the top Y. By default, you have a little bit of a buffer in your page. So I'm going to move my screen here just for a second so that you can see my paragraph doesn't go all the way to the top of the page, nor does it go all the way to the left of the page. Move this back up. So I can designate whether the body has a margin or not. Left margin, right margin, top, and bottom, I can make those changes. Let's go to our Appearance HTML. Now that we're on Appearance HTML, you'll notice that we have some of the same options that we had under Appearance CSS. So why are there two? This is what's called really legacy, and it's left over from older versions of Dreamweaver. Some people might actually be more comfortable with this, but if we're using CSS in our files, we don't necessarily want to choose this because it won't actually create CSS for us. So we're not going to choose anything here, and we're going to go down to our next category, which is our links, which shows the CSS in parentheses, so I know that it's going to make sure and add this to my CSS file. So I have a link font, a size for my links, link colors, etc. So when I start here, do I really want to change my font? Now, in my appearance category up above, 
I was able to choose a default font that is going to be attached to my body tag, which will be my font for everything. I don't necessarily need a separate font for my links as well, especially if they're going to be in my page. And I just want to make sure that when they click on them, they go somewhere or do something. So I don't necessarily need this to be anything different. Except you may want to choose a bold, for instance, if you want to have them stand out a little bit more on your page. It's really what your end user expects. Do you have an older audience? Do you have a newer, younger audience? That will be the determining factor in how you want your links presented. I'm not going to change the size here either because I've already changed the size for my appearance otherwise. But we can take a look at our link colors now. Now by default we have our link colors as blue and our rollover colors as purple or something like that. I can never remember because I always come in here and change them myself. So when I choose a link color, you don't want it to be the same color as your page color. So let's say uh, we choose a green for my link color. Now I've got three other choices. I really want to choose these all so that they are in my CSS so everything works nicely. When I choose them here, they will be in the correct order also in my CSS. My rollover links will choose next, and I'll choose a nice blue for that. So when you're looking at the page and you see a link, you're going to see the link color is green. And when the user rolls over with their cursor on that particular link, it is now going to show up as blue. But what if they come back to a page that they've already been at before? We also have visited links, and then we have active links. So my active link is like a rollover for my visited link. So once they've been to the page and I roll my cursor over that link that they've already been there, then I get my active link. It really depends on how you have your site set up, whether you want these to be different or not. A lot of times I just choose the exact same color for my visited links as my regular link color and choose the same color for my rollover and active links as well. But just so we can take a look at our page, we'll choose totally different colors for each thing. And maybe orange. Doesn't matter whether they're pretty or not at the moment. So now we have underline styles. How do we want our links presented? So do I want it to always underline, which would underline both on the link itself and for the rollover link? Do I want it to never underline? Do I want it to show underline only on rollover or hide underline our rollover? Again, this all goes back to who your audience is. Does your audience expect a link? Is your audience used to the internet and when they see some text of a different color, they know that it's probably going to be a link and when they roll their cursor over it, they see their hand, so they know for sure that that's going to be a link. You've got a change of color when they roll their cursor over it, so they already know that. So what I choose here will typically depend on who my audience is. And we'll just choose show underline only on rollover. Our heading category. So this is where I can make sure and put the heading sizes and colors for what I'm going to be using on my page. Now headings themselves have to do with orders of importance. You want to make sure and use your headings so that search engines know what parts of your page are more important than others. For instance, I always want to use them in order as well. So if I have a main section at the top of my page, I want to designate it then with maybe a heading 1. Subheads with a heading 2. Anything that goes with a subhead in the same section of a subhead, then maybe a heading 3, 4, 5, or 6 really just depending on how much that you actually need, but you want to use them in order on the page so that the search engines see them in order of importance. So for our heading 1, for instance, since we're using M's for our measurement, I'm going to say 2 M's, and we'll give this an actual color, something other than black, just so that we can see what's what on our page. 
and I'm just going to choose a color. For my heading 2, I'm going to choose 1.6. EM and choose another color. For right now, that's the only ones that we'll choose, but normally I would go ahead and fill all of them out. Next is your title and encoding. Now this is the third place that you can change your title at. We've talked about being able to change your title at the top of your page, at the top of your window, in the code itself, and this is the third place that I can make sure and change the title so you don't end up with that untitled document. Here I can also change the document type. So for instance, if I were doing a page and I wanted to make sure that it was XHTML 1.0 strict, for instance, or 1.1, or maybe I was doing something strictly for mobile, or even HTML5, even though right at the moment we can have very limited access to what we're able to do with HTML5. I'm going to leave it at 1.0 transitional. Next is my encoding. I could change that if I needed it. The same thing with my Unicode. Again, just how I want my special characters designated on my page. I can also see my document folder and my site folder structure. And if you click on your tracing image, your tracing image is something that we used to use a fair amount of when we used absolutely positioned items inside of Dreamweaver. The problem with a tracing image, even though that we can add one, is that things aren't always pixel perfect in every browser. So while it's great in theory, it's not necessarily something that you'll use all that often. But what it is is that I have a JPEG or a GIF, for instance, of the actual look and feel of the site that I have. I would add a tracing image in, back off on the transparency of it, so it's just kind of a ghosted back image. And then when I would build, basically think of it like a puzzle, when I'm putting the puzzle pieces back together for the site, I can try and line it up as much as possible with that tracing image. Again, great in theory, but not necessarily a practical use. Go ahead and click OK. And I'm going to scroll up on the code side of my page a little bit so I can see the beginning of my CSS. Now this is an embedded CSS style. So I see a tag that says style type equals, and in my quote marks, text slash CSS. Then I also have an end tag for that, and I scroll down. Right above my end of my head tag, I see the end of my style tag. I'll scroll back up, so I see body, TD, and TH, where I added my font family, my size, and my color for my body tag. This will also change any table heading, and table data or my cell structure to have the same properties as my body tag. I'm going to scroll down just a little bit and let's talk about our links in here. So I see that I have my link, visited, hover, and active. If I choose all four of these, they need to be in this exact order. There's a little saying that we have in CSS that help us remember that order. It's a love-hate relationship. So the L in love for my link, the V in love for my visited, the H in hate for my hover, and the A in hate for my active. Love, hate, relationship. Because we want to make sure that they're in the right order or they won't be displayed properly. Now if I take a look at my page, my font has changed. Now I see that I have a header one that is designated in green. I have my subhead in two. I didn't style my subhead 3 or my 4, so those are just the default. And I didn't change my list item yet either, so that should look exactly the same except for my font family being different. So next we'll take a look at actually putting text on our page.